just an intern, actually an international intern. Um, this is Luke Goldschmidt. And of course, I have my co-host, uh, George Christie, Good who is our, is our official analyst. Yep, we're still but, working but on But also title. the uh, founder of Wine Industry Network, which is a very important resource for the wine and beer industry. Well, thank you, Susie. Absolutely. <laughs> a proper introduction. Yeah, very nice. And, Lu and Luke, we're going to start, of course, by tasting a wine. Yeah. And so, so Luke, let me tell, I'm going to give a little bit of your background, if that's okay. Yeah. So, Luke grew up in a family involved in the business of wine, and uh, Luke's dad, Nick Goldschmidt, was one of the first guests I actually had on this show, which was nice of him. And he's a, a very prominent, world-renowned winemaker. I think he's consulted in nine countries or something yeah, about crazy so. like that. And your mom is an attorney and runs the Goldschmidt Empire. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's she's she's um she's very, a re real boss. <laughs> she's in, she's impressive, yeah. very impressive. So they have um, quite a family operation going on. So I assume that you must have gotten interested in yeah. wine when you were very young. Yeah, it kind of, I mean, I would say it did always happen naturally. No, I, I can always remember my dad saying, uh, even young, that to not to not go into wine, that it's not something that you're going to want to do. And uh, I remember maybe when I was when I was 18 or 17. <laughs> he told you that when you were young, that's yeah, funny. Yeah, and I was like telling my mom, I'm like, oh, I got to do something for university. And I, I think like wine is the thing to do. I mean, I had worked in a number of wineries in, the, in and around the area already because you know, well, and Luke is a local Healdsburg yeah from Healdsburg born and raised well and it's amazing really that the, the Healdsburg uh, kids have a lot of exposure to wine more than they even realize I think sometimes yeah. the so general you, the general IQ is a little higher for wine around here <laughs> so, so you obviously you grew up in Healdsburg and then you were trying to decide what to do for school yeah so I actually ended up telling my mom because I didn't want to tell my dad. <laughs> I was like, I think, uh, <laughs> I think wine's pretty interesting to me. There was a, I always saw like a bit of a balance in between being scientific and also uh, artistic. So there was um, a little bit of longevity in it when you can take, take something that is a crop and, and share that, you know, many more years oh, down yeah. the line. And well, you watch them buy vineyards and because yeah. it, it's more than winemaking in your family, it's also growing and yeah. planting and designing. As I've grown up, I also feel that, you know, wine is so much, it is more than that. It is a bit of a family. Like when I get to sit down with my, my four other siblings and have a glass of wine, especially during quarantine when, you know, we're not hanging out with too many other people, can have a, a party with just, just family. So I did also fail to mention that uh, there are uh, five children yeah. in the Goldschmidt family. It's a beautiful family, and you are the oldest boy, correct? Yeah. So I have one older sister and two younger sisters and a brother, and they, they my three sisters all have wines that my dad, uh, you know, dedicates to them. Yeah, they um, names after, that's, I know, yeah. it's fun. Unfortunately, not myself and my brother, though. <laughs> <laughs> Only the yeah, girls? Yeah, just the, the girls. Just but the girls have their wine names? Yeah, that's okay. He we've, said, he said his dad said uh, boys' names don't sell. Yeah, the <laughs> philosophy. Probably, so, so. They, they did some market research and, yeah. <laughs> and decided Luke wouldn't sell like Chelsea. Yeah, <laughs> he's had these philosophies a long time and just they're not going to be changed. <laughs> well, that's we'll another see. interesting thing about um, your parents. They're, they're not just in uh, vineyards and wine. They also are very heavily into the marketing yeah. and, and the sales. So, so you're sort of around the whole picture of wine. Yeah, very much. I think... That's been a huge progression for them. I think maybe, I want to say close to 2014, 13, my parents saw a little bit more opportunity in, in the wines that they were making, and that's when they kind of start to go down more avenues for, for marketing rather than just focusing on their wines, because their wines are amazing, and like, uh, they can stand alone, but much, e much more difficult to sell, you know, exactly. have to find these avenues that, you know, maybe aren't so clear. Well, what would we say? The easy part's making it, the hard part's selling it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. A lot of hard work. So right now, your current internship is yeah. at Aperture Winery, which is local. It's only about a mile from here. Yeah, nice and close. It's a new facility with uh, the winemaker, Jesse Katz, who I met a, a couple years ago. He's uh, a younger winemaker, but 
very he, well experienced. He's and very up and coming too. He's a, like really good he's mentor. A, he's a hot. He's a hot yeah. brand at the moment. He went through the uh, the same university program that I did. We've had some of the same instructors and such like and, that. And where was that? Uh, Fresno State. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. The hands-on yeah. school, huh? So uh, I've. Re I mean, I came back a little earlier this year from my previous harvest in Argentina because of uh, coronavirus and such. Yeah. So ended up getting in contact with him and, and I mean, he's doing some really unique stuff with, with his wines. Uh, definitely has a style that uh, has, has a lot for me to learn from. There's well, and he focuses on Bordeaux varietals, yeah. correct? And um, he has a beautiful facility. Yeah, he does. In fact, his, uh, his dad is going to be on one of our shows oh. in the future, so that's sort of fun. And he's great. I have, have you tasted this yeah, yet? It's delicious. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, so this is a, mm, this is the good. Bordeaux Blanc 2019. It's uh, a Sauvignon Blanc. There's a little bit of, uh, of a Sauvignon Mosquet clone in there, which uh, Jesse's really, really into. It's got a bit more of a uh, tropical fruit character. And then- And then maybe a little of the floral yeah, characteristic the comes floral. from that. And it also has, I, I believe in this vintage, it's 3% Sauvignon, so just a touch to, to give it a little bit of that. Uh, a little bit more texture, that nuttiness. It's delicious. Yeah. It's very, very good. It also, it's a little bit cool in Hillsburg tonight, and it has um, mm. has very good mouthfeel. It has holds up to this cooler weather. Yeah, definitely. It has a little, definitely more presence in the mouth rather than uh, what, we'll, what we'll have a little bit later from New Zealand, which is going to be lean. That's actually uh, one mm. of the reasons I wanted to, to bring this. It was going to be quite a contrast from from what the others are well it's a lovely wine yeah. and um, the philosophy is really cool too I really like so Andy's a photographer for the, the labels and so that's the word the name aperture yeah for aperture exactly so um, these are supposed to be so, a soil specific set of labels that these wines are un very unique in character based on the soils, kind of in the same way that when you take a photo, it's just of a single, a single location and spot. And so he was trying to translate it into the, into the bottle, and I think it's done very well. So, the, so it's probably the concept of the wine has a sense of place and a yeah. sense of the environment. Exactly. It's really, it's really pretty. Yeah. It's very good. And obviously you worked on the 2020 yeah, so Vintage. so we're tell us what you're doing. Tell us what you did with this internship, and then we're going to sort of work backwards. Yeah, so uh, I I jumped in to this maybe in June. I I jumped in with uh, with the team at Aperture, and as it was pretty lean because there's still new uh, new facility trying to. Um, I know he was scrambling things. up yeah. until harvest because he was. Yeah. I mean, just because I'd run into him, he he did a great job of pulling it all together yeah. and got a great team too. Such a good team, and that's a lot of the reason I was excited about it because, you know, I I feel that I I had some experience in some of the high end wineries in the past and felt that I could, uh, hopefully benefit him and and I think I have and I've really enjoyed the time there. It's been, it was a bit hectic with the fires and and with regulations for um, public health and things like that. It's definitely uh, one that's going to be remembered. <laughs> no, you're um, casually saying some of the great wineries. That <laughs> <laughs> He's telling the truth. Yep. <laughs> we will uh, look at your background. So, so did you do um, cellar work and vineyard? Did you do vineyard things as well? Yeah. So. I, when I started back in June and July, I actually got to spend quite a bit of time in, in Aperture's uh, vineyards. Most of them, or some being in Geyserville, some on Chalk Hill. Uh -huh. um, this one actually coming from Sonoma Valley. But uh, it, it, it was uh, really beneficial to like, see some of these site-specific site uh, vineyards that he's got. Um, much different than, you know, or not too different from what I see in my own family's winery or vineyards and such, but, oh, yeah. but it was definitely uh, nice to see some vineyards that I had even previously known and, and some new ones. Well, I bet uh, Jesse also appreciated um, your, the knowledge and experience that you bring. Yeah. And I'm sure you enjoyed even just bantering about. Very much. I actually, I think one of my first internships was actually with Redwood Empire, the uh, vineyard management company in Geyserville. 
And that was years ago, and I, I always think back on it as one of the, uh, the jobs that I probably learned some of the most on, just as a being applied learning out in the vineyards, uh, seeing the leaves, seeing the, the sets, the stages of veraison, and even prior to that in growth. Were you doing actual vineyard work there? Yeah, replanting, pest it's hard. control. Like, oh, it was it's harder than people realize. It's pretty challenging. I, I think actually harder than some of the vintages I've done <laughs> still. By the way, your fan club just arrived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luke has yeah. some fans out there, of course. So. Got some co-workers here. I think that's cool that you did. Uh, what a great way to start, right? Just spending time out in the vineyard. I mean, I know. yeah, and starting at the very beginning of the process. Yeah, and really kind of getting comfortable and intimately familiar with what is happening in the vineyard, and then migrating, you know, into the yeah. Center. Especially with all, a lot of my uh, my formal education in university is most a lot of it's uh, just wine focused, enology focused. I obviously did take a couple of viticulture classes and, and such, but. Uh, to actually be thrown into the vineyard and and uh, take this analysis on on where we are in growth stages and things like that, that was something very new for me and still like one of the most beneficial uh, positions that I think I got to got to have. Yeah, I'm curious. When you arrived at Fresno State, did you have probably a really strong background compared to your peers? Given yeah, I your can remember and being 18 in classes where the average age is 26 or 27. Wow. It was very uh, unusual at first, but I ended up, you know, becoming friends with a lot of these people that, you know, are still around here in Sonoma County, very much so. So, uh, yeah, it was unusual at first to be so young in, in these these courses, but definitely got kind of brought in once people... Yeah, but I'm sure your knowledge level was very high yeah, going in. It took a little bit for, for some of the other students to kind of let me in, <laughs> but they definitely did, and definitely still excellent friends that I made. So, if I read this correctly, uh, Luke did six internships in four years. Yeah. That is been amazing. That's amazing. amazing. S seven now with my three and a half at Aperture. <laughs> That's just unbelievable. That's yeah. really impressive. And Se I'm sorry, go ahead. Seven harvests back to back, I think someone said was a bit crazy, and I'm, I would agree. I think well, it's time to have a... <laughs> well, you obviously had to change hemispheres, Yeah. which <laughs> gets us to your, your background. We'll start at the beginning with Opus One was your first internship, and yeah. that was 2017? Yeah, 2017. So I would have graduated in, in May, and I got lucky enough. Uh, I had obviously been looking at a couple different places, but... Got in contact with uh, Michael oh, Salachi. Yeah. And there is the beautiful Opus One. Yeah. It's so hard not to recognize such a beautiful winery in Napa. Super recognizable as you pass by. But uh, the team, I got brought in as an intern, and I think there were four other interns, and it was such a good team. We had a couple people doing um, a lot of micro work, working on natural inoculations for all their wines, uh, cultivating the yeasts from the vineyards themselves. We So it wasn't just, obviously it was a big learning experience. It wasn't just yeah. seller work. And that's what people don't understand about interns. It's, um, they're there to learn and the wineries want you there and they want to teach you, I believe. Yeah, I think and Opus was one of those ones that was set up very much for that. When, when we showed up, they took all these opportunities to teach us as interns, you know, take us aside, let us taste, I mean, I got a taste of vertical of Opus, yeah. I, probably in like the first few weeks. Um, now, it's, so I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I just yeah. want you to know what we're watching. This is a night harvest video that Rob took uh, several years ago of Opus. Those just so you know what that was. Those but guys are athletes. So they, <laughs> so they, are. they are athletes out there. So you, so you got to taste a vertical flight as soon as you got there, they wanted to let you jump in to understanding yeah, the I think brand. Yeah, I, I think I got lucky because there was someone visiting that they opened all the bottles for and then they, all, they let the, uh, the crew taste as well. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily for us, but Was it the first time out. you'd tasted it? Um, I, I think I've, I had had an Opus once before, but to, to taste them vertically like that and be able to recognize, you know, what, what vintages do, did I prefer or, you know, you start to see 
climate trends as well. You can taste like a late rain or, or a, a heavy heat or something like that. It, it kind of like put it in a better perspective for me because oh, wow. before that I hadn't necessarily gotten to do too many uh, so that so they were explaining to you that you're getting this flavor because this particular year had yeah or we, we would go custard. through take take some notes and then go back and ask and talk and and even with the other interns and stuff it was I mean they were all really knowledgeable people some the French South African like people with other backgrounds as well it was really really beneficial it was I'm, I'm sure it's a very desirable internship right to get the opus oh, yeah. deal. Yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent. Beautiful facility, beautiful did, winery, did you, beautiful Did you wines. answer an ad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. I'm just joking. Immaculate yeah, facility, out. right? I mean, this place is the, the cleanest. Yeah. Everything's perfect. I can remember on my first week, definitely first week, I just put a clamp on the ground. Right. And they were like, can't put that clamp on the ground because it's not sanitary. And I just, I flicked back to college and I was like, I gotta, I gotta like be able to know this. Like, this is obviously something that needs to be done, but it was just a... An example of that that opus is to the to the T on on it's anything like that the they standards can, everything yeah, is, anything they can control is is controlled. Yeah, I remember going there many years ago, and they used to have crystal bungs. Crystal bungs. I didn't. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I don't Do know if I saw have? any, but they did. Yeah, the glass oh, bungs. Gl okay, gl yeah. well, they were crystal, actually crystal, were crystal, yeah. I think. But so no uh, no glass bungs. <laughs> Not that I remember. I remember them being around. I don't remember them being in the barrels though. <laughs> Oh, what, did, yeah. what was your what was your like takeaway impression after being at Opus One in terms of it wine was, making? It was just that that high standard to to see a winery that you know functioned at such a high level and and realize that it is really possible to you know to to cover all your bases and and check all this this stuff that you know I've had worked in wineries in the past but you know everyone kind of takes a blind eye to certain things or whatever it was but. At Opus, it was just so meticulous, and and it felt really true to to the wine. Felt like the wine was like such a. It was the most important thing there, really. Yeah. And it was. So even nice though it's that. a beautiful facility, um, and obviously they have they spend a lot of money and all that, the the focus is on the wine. Yeah. And, but I think that's probably going to be true at every. Yeah. Facility we follow exactly. shortly. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it eventually became a trend, like. It was the first one, and it was it was an excellent example of it. Beautiful, beautiful time until you know a little bit of fire at the end there. At you know, it was 2017. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Did were there a lot of grapes out still? No, almost every we were. Since the end of October. Yeah, it was much later than it was this year. It was I remember we were 90 percent picked, like not a whole lot going on. But I do remember sitting up at the top of their their terrace and at the end of some work days and having a glass of wine and you would watch the, the helicopters put out the fires on the other side of the valley. There was a photo we saw earlier of the glass of wine on the terrace. Was yeah, that exactly the, that. Yeah, yeah I, noticed, I noticed that earlier. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Did you live in Napa? Yeah, I was living in downtown Napa at the time. Uh, after living in Healdsburg for so long, I, you know, I was happy to go and actually live in Napa other than that, other than just visiting. So yeah, it's got a good taste of it. Well, it's a, it's it's a little bit different over there. It is I mean, definitely. It's like a, I mean, definitely it a bit is. Different. So it's only an hour yeah. and fifteen minutes, but it's like a different character. Yes. And Good though. I definitely enjoyed oh, it. Oh no, definitely it's had great fun. over there. Uh, yeah. The fan club needs a little bit of wine, but <laughs> we we will. Um, if you want to grab a glass, and we will. Here, there you go. Um, yeah. Move on to your next experience which I believe was Chile correct yeah so I went down to Chile in the beginning of 2018 and that was my first uh, my first international harvest and how, how did you hear about did you were you sort of now in a network of international interns I started to build one definitely pretty quickly and and Chile I think is probably the place where it expanded the quickest um, this winery Viña Razzaris I mean, not a lot of people know very many wineries in Chile, and this is, this one is stellar. Making 100-point wines in a couple categories, Cabernets, uh, wow. Chile being known for Carmenere, or, uh, yes, Carmenere, and making some amazing Carmenere's, as well as Pinots and Syrahs. They were, they were all over the place, but it was a, a winery my dad had been involved with for a very long time, so, like, knew a few people there, and 
I mean, they always need the workers down in Chile. They're not gonna. <laughs> they're not well, gonna turn down some work. <laughs> Luke, I can guarantee you that you obviously did a great job at Opus, or you would not have moved on. True. To Chile. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, undoubtedly. I think. I think it ended up being one of the, the heart, the t the most, physical harvests. You know. They were pretty good on 12-hour days, but full days. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that. and this is the one that says E. I think it says E R C. Easy, easy, e e yeah. E N Z. Okay, is this uh, yes? This is Campo Viejo, actually. Oh no, that's Spain. Spain. Well, then why don't we talk about yeah. Spain real quick? So we're going <laughs> to skip yeah. on to Spain, which is fine. I got a. <laughs> this is easy. This is a raspberry. Okay, we're back. So we're back the, in. You Chile. see the mountains in the back. Yeah, that almost has an Opus One looking. It's amazing. Yes, that that new facility on the right. This is also uh, a raspberries. Um, so they had a very modern facility. I think we might get another photo. This is my team. Oh, we lived sure. together at the winery. Oh, you did? Wow. So there were four of us at the winery 24-7. We just switched shifts. This is the inside of the, of the winery. You see three levels. The barrels are on the bottom. Nice. Tanks. Mm -hmm. So it's all gravity fed. Wow. How, it, okay, now I think we're on to yeah. a different... But uh, it was... Yeah. Having that uh, that team that those the eight of us living in that house, I think that's we had some Venezuelan, Argentinian, English, like people from all over the place. Quite a few Chileans as well, and I, that's kind of where I first started to build a a big base of of other in international interns, and, and I'm still really good friends with all those guys. So did they um, did the winery hire eight interns total, and all of you? were the interns for the harvest and you they had housing for you and pretty much uh, it being my first international harvest I guess I didn't really know what to expect but man they threw us in it I think like pretty much with the eight of us were you nervous we, about it I don't I wasn't even nervous because I didn't know what to expect I never had a so you just got on a plane and yeah and I think it was very good that I did it like that but we ended up you know really managing that winery It'd be the middle of the night, and it's just myself and and three of my housemates, and we gotta like take first manage everyone else that's there, and then like do our own work. It was full on, very full on. So basically, they just put you all together, and then you all sort it out. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, we had some assigned jobs. I was I'm I was based mostly in the cellar floor, while some may have been, you know, dealing with trucking or grapes coming in or or uh, management of of spa wine space and stuff, but I was, I was mostly on uh, physical like team, like uh, practices, things like digging out tanks, things like making sure pump overs are getting done, uh, any any ins and outs that are a little bit more difficult, I would have to go and do uh, on my own or or whatever it was. But they had a really cool style there and and really innovative as well, kind of like Opus. They had Wait, now when you say. Um they had, they were innovative. Are you talking about in terms of equipment and, or just ha winemaking in general? Yeah, in their winemaking and, and their equipment. Uh, that new facility, there was a, a photo in there, that, that round one that looks a little bit like Opus. They put together uh, some conical concrete tanks, yep. something that's pretty uh, uh, particular. They really liked Malbec in that, where you have more uh, juice to pulp uh, contact, right. things like that. They were doing, uh, they had amphor um, clay pots there. How big were the clay pots? Mm. Just curious. That's sort of uh, a thing now, isn't it, George? Yeah. yeah, more of it. And the eggs, of course, are. Yeah, yeah the, the eggs, eggs are. People love those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to say maybe they were a little under a thousand, thousand liters, maybe a thousand liters. Look Manageable. at you talking yeah. in metric system. What, what's wrong? Uh, yeah, Aren't you American? I, <laughs> I do have a tough time with that. that to gallons, please. <laughs> I do have a tough time Good with that. for you. I have a tough time the opposite yeah. direction. What about like language chat? Like, is it, like, do you speak how many languages? I mean, I speak Spanish okay. uh, very proficiently now. Okay. Uh, Chile was, I mean, I spoke a little bit of Spanish before that, and Chilean Spanish is not the place to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did pick it up. So um, it's a different type of. Yeah, they got a dialect. lot of their own words, a lot of their own slang. They leave some letters out. They <laughs> mostly they got a lot of their own words, right. words that no one would use anywhere else. So if you actually hear a Chilean speaking, 
that's not in Chile. Right. It's very easy to figure out like where he comes from. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, was the wow. food good? Okay. Well, don't <laughs> worry, we're going to worry, we're going to be in Spain soon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It was not known for the food, it was known for the hard work, the friends. Yeah, the the experience going to got to go to the vineyards and stuff, being right at the foot of the Andes like such a, a unique place to be growing wine. Yeah, it cr looks incredibly beautiful too. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. It does look pretty. It was full. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but what would you say um, your impression, your number one impression is when you left that facility? I mean, even including how what a great sense of camaraderie and friendship you got yeah. through. Uh, I mean, it's funny. People ask me, like, what my favorite harvest was or which one I'd go back to. And I didn't get paid much there, and it's I worked like, a lot. So it's like talking about your favorite children. Right, you don't do that. I would go back <laughs> in a minute, though. I, yeah. I really did enjoy it. Um, wine's totally stellar, like, blew me away. And then, obviously, the team, the winemaking team as well, the, the head winemakers named uh, uh, Francisco Betting, and I'm pretty sure he just got winemaker of the year in South America, or in Chile itself, uh, this, this, this past year. So he's uh, still a, a really good contact and, and someone that uh, I, can, I reach out to from time to time. Nice. That's fabulous. That's great. Okay, so I think we might try the yeah. next wine, and I'm really excited about the next winery that you visited. I believe it was Louis Latour. It was. Correct? Yeah. Uh, that's so awesome. See, you're the first guest to comfortably throw wine into the plants. Oh, <laughs> it was just a little bit. It was it's just impressive. a little bit. <laughs> good job. Everybody else always asks. <laughs> your your instincts right. are good. I like that. <laughs> Okay. So this is a oh here I can yeah. pass this really for you. It's a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. So, Thank you. On, in contrast to this previous Sauvignon Blanc, this one is first from New Zealand. So very classic. It's going to be a lot more a lot more lean and green. A little bit of uh, like passion fruit, melon. A lot of like a little bit of honeydew in it bit more acidity, some citrus note to it. In This is from Marlborough, the famous mm. Sav Blanc region of New Zealand. And there's a split in between the soils there. You have like glacial soils on one half of it and river soils on the other. I remember seeing that my, when my dad came here, he brought the other Sauvignon Blanc that, that he makes that comes from some of those glacial so soils. And so I thought I'd bring this one a little bit more, a little bit more soft in the mouth comparatively to, to his or to the to the other. So this is a boulder bank. It has uh, some round stones on the front just uh, representing what you what you might find in those vineyards. Nice. Now is this a vineyard that your family owns? Yeah, so this is on a, a section of road called the Golden Mile in, in Marlborough and it's a, I don't know how big the plot is but it's it's all it's valley Valley floor. Well, but you, of course, will say it in hectares, so it won't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> I actually can't do hectares. That's the one I can't do. But uh, yeah, I spent a little bit of time, I, not as an internship, but uh, I did go to New Zealand in the middle of trying to get a visa to work in, in Europe, and I, I, I worked very close to this vineyard. Um, got, to, got to pass by, do a little bit of photography there, did a little bit of pruning on the vineyard. <laughs> So, oh, so you did work a little bit in New Zealand? Yeah. It's, I, it's it, not on your internship sheet. Yeah, I was only there for a month and a half it or so. It counts. It does. It's amazing. It was, uh, it was really cool working there because it was off-season work. I got to do a lot of fining and filtering for white wines, which is, you know, if I'm working at Opus and Eraseries, I'm mostly doing reds. Right. So to be in New Zealand and, and see a little bit of, of, mm. of the post-process, not the ferment, you know, I know how to... I've seen ferment, but to to see some of the the post process for for the whites was super beneficial. Yeah, something I I still haven't seen anywhere else. Wow, this is absolutely delicious. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's this, actually, is, this is one of my favorites. I've, it's actually yeah. elegant. Yeah, even even in the cold, you know, I'm definitely enjoying that still. Is this something that people can purchase in the United States? Yes, they s um, definitely on on my family's uh, website at goldschmidtvineyards.com. You can get all these wines, but wow, um, this is really yeah, this in particular is still sold in the U.S. I think working on mm -hmm. getting it sold in New Zealand, it's a little bit of a different market there, right. obviously, so saturated with Sauvignon Blanc that right. 
wow. can be quite difficult. Well, it, how do you describe it? It's very approachable. Yeah, it's elegant. Just, it's, it's not... It's kind of not really what I expected. Um, I know. A little bit more mouthfeel than I, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you said it was leaner, but I, I don't... I wouldn't say it's like a... a well, like it's a leaner than the aperture, maybe. Yeah, but... but, but much uh, cooler climate where it comes from. And wow, this is... A beautiful I would recommend acid. that anybody purchase this wine. Yeah. It's really good. This is definitely one of my favorites that my, my family makes. Uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I'm definitely uh, a bit biased too. <laughs> I can't help it. Well, it's delicious. Okay, yeah. back to your next job. The Adventures We're, of Luke. They just unbelievable. The Adventures yeah. of Luke, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, so he his next job was Louis Latour. That's it. There he is. It the, was rustic in France. You gotta take your boots off and do the punch downs with your feet. <laughs> oh, that Get that was going, you actually did that. that? Yeah. And so this is the winery. Um, you can see the the heavy stone up that up that row. Burgundy's uh, that full is of beautiful. limestone. This is a uh, Corton Charlemagne, the only south facing Grand Cru, a white Grand Cru in the in the region. And, and it's what Louis Latour is mostly known for. And I, I spent uh, seven weeks pruning in that vineyard. Wow. And that's at, at that time. Did it was, you take that photo? Yeah. That is it beautiful. Was, what it, a moment. I took, oh, uh, the vineyards there, I must have taken a photo like every two days because it was just like insane. Didn't even know what like photo I might send, but uh, that vineyard itself was just incredible. I actually have been to Louis Latour. Oh, it's, it's a very, very special place. Yeah. You've been there? I haven't. I'm, I'm curious about the transition now from now is from, from Chile to, to Latour. Like that was that? A big flip, yeah. Yeah. Um, Latour is small, really small. I mean, well, I think. The bone is small. Yeah, they have like 42 tank, 42 wood tanks, and none of them are bigger than five Oh, you're tons. saying at the winery it was that small? Yeah, it was real small there. I mean, other than their, they had a separate section for whites, but I was. Uh, working with the Reds mostly and doing those those punch downs and such. Those tanks didn't get much bigger than that. So it was very hands on. I definitely struggled a little bit speaking French, but uh, I, if I did speak French, I think that would have been for sure my favorite spot. Just such amazing food, really cool people. I got to live, um, if you know where Bone, Bone is, mm -hmm. the uh, city right in the middle of, of the Côte d'Or in, in Burgundy. And I was living in a village of maybe 100 people just outside of it. So I'd have to ride my bike in and out of town. Wow. <laughs> oh, do you ride your bike to work? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I could, walk, I could walk to work, but I had to ride my bike to town. OK. Oh, to yeah. town, I see. And did they, um, how, did, how did that transpire? It, mm, it was actually quite difficult, you know? France has got, had a little bit more laws about having foreigners go work. and. Uh, luckily, I have a New Zealand passport, so I've kind of slipped through using that uh, to get a lot of my international visas to oh, work. Oh, so you have dual citizenship. Yeah. Nice. Thankfully, so I've I've used that to manage uh, getting visas in, in other workplaces. But uh, Christoph is the, uh, the, man the winemaker and manager in Louis Latour, and he was super uh, excited to have me. He really made an effort to, to bring me on and... And he was the only person, maybe one of two people that maybe spoke English there, but was super supportive, uh, helped me out with a lot of things. I've learned so much there. And, and in France, wine is different. It's uh, right. got a different kind of reputation than it does here. And, and especially in Burgundy, where such a small parcel has got so much reputation over just hundreds of years. They've been making wine on that one little spot. Yeah. It was really so beautiful. So much tradition, right? That's just... So much and, tradition. You know, and you have a little rolling that now yeah you know that's pretty cool yeah definitely like yeah didn't quite understand it too much before going there and and spending uh maybe four months there it was really beautiful hey, hey luke when you roll in like um as you kind of and i know we're going to talk about the other places you went but is there a little bit of like um i, I can't think of the, a, a better word but like competitiveness from hey you're the, you know you're part of a crew of interns like who's the hardest worker <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I, I know question. me, I'm very competitive, yeah. right? So I'd want to, you, you, you know, you want to be, That's true. you want their approval, right? So, I mean, I'm sure there's like a little competitive like that with regard to like yeah. how fast you shovel out a tank and how <laughs> clean you leave everything and stuff like that. I think so, definitely. You know, when I show up, especially as an international, people, people are going to doubt because, you know, well, first you don't speak your language, you don't, you don't know customs or whatever. You just don't really understand the way things work. So when I show up, you know, the first first couple weeks are going to be real 
uh, real learning process, really putting myself into it. Really, I really try to say yes about everything. Try to take any opportunity that I can. Also, not just in the winery, but you know, if if I have coworkers that are going to go, you know, to the bar and have a drink afterwards, even if I've I've worked a long day, I'm going to learn something if I go with them. Yeah. Whether whether it is wine based or or just life based, I think that that is that's something that I really try to yeah. try to put myself into. What would you do on your days off in Bone? Probably I rest. Ran, I ran a lot. I was. Uh, oh, you did. I was doing a lot of runs at the time. the The vineyards are just so expansive, and they're all. They have a few paved roads, and they're just so beautiful. They really like. Uh, I would. I think I would run maybe three days a week after work. It was just so gorgeous. Spend one one day a week after work going into the grocery store and such. Um, but oh. not too much more. I, not not too many people because I couldn't speak French, and and Bones a very small place regardless. I did live right across the road from a church, though, and, and that made sleeping very difficult. <laughs> They'd ring that bell uh, every half hour, <laughs> all the way through the all night. All night, every like, All the way through the <laughs> night. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you share a room there, too? Did you, did you like, how did, like, all the interns? Yeah, I actually had my own room at this spot, okay. but um, other people living at the domain. Okay. And I was living at the, wi or just down the road from the winery, kind of okay. in their office facility rather than at the, at the production area. Yeah, it was incredible. Well, and it must have been unique in that you went from a high technology environment to old school. So old school, yeah. And you must really appreciate different styles of approaching. It was. and Making great wine. Seeing things like, you know, like getting my feet dirty in the, in the tanks and, and brass fittings and... Um, brass fittings that you didn't leave on yeah. the floor. <laughs> like, well, not even necessarily sanitizing everything that things touched, and it was just like a, a much different philosophy that they were that they were getting that they were there. Right. And you know, so I got to check myself. You know, I might show up and be like, oh, I don't know if this is the way to do this, or at least it's not the way that I've learned. Right. You got to like, you know, check yourself. And I mean, they've been making wine as long as the U.S. has been the U.S. Like, yeah. <laughs> more. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so just taking it for what it is and, and learning from it a lot. And, and it definitely benefited me again, going down, the, going down to other uh, wineries to integrate that, that kind yeah. of character into it. Yeah. That's so cool. What, now what? Yeah, what, yeah what's <laughs> next? Yeah, what's next? <laughs> this is great. Ooh, uh, Australia, I jumped down to Australia in. Okay. And now Luke is actually at uh, Penfolds. Yeah, down uh, 2019, wow. first months. In the Barossa Valley. I, I found this as like a kind of a nice break because I'd pre... So I, oh, oh, yeah, this is are. it. So um, Penfolds is really big on Shiraz. It's the Barossa Valley. They, they use a lot of these big punchins for, uh, for long, long aging. Mm -hmm. This is what's unique in Australia is they use heading boards to push the cap underneath the ferment. So it's actually just wine that you can see on top, but the skins are actually being held down by those boards behind. Oh, really? Do they, um, I assume they still use rotary fermenters? They do still use rotary fermenters quite, that was the only place that I've, I've really messed around with them. Uh, so getting to Australia, seeing like different practices, you know, they also were really big on American oak compared to like, you know, places that I was before that almost only used French oak. So this really, so you're, with these experiences, you really are going into a completely different winemaking yeah. environment to to see and and this is a little maybe get this a little bit from my dad but to you can you can make different wines in different places obviously but to, to make a wine that represents where it comes from is is kind of the goal and so when I jump from place to place I kind of focus on one wine you know in Burgundy I'm looking at I went to Burgundy because I like white Burgundy no offense to Bordeaux but like white Burgundy is like something that I you know, look at and like the, like the representation of Carmenere in Chile, uh, Shiraz in the Barossa Valley. These are like really specific wines that can't really be matched the same way made elsewhere. And so your experience at uh, Penfolds, was it another situation where you were with a group of interns as a Yeah, it was a bit team? different in Australia. So I felt like I'd just done Chile in, in France and that is two cultures very different than what I'm used to. Yeah. So a bit more challenging. Australia, 
My parents are Kiwis. I got a lot of Australian friends. I knew people before I showed up there. It was a lot smoother. That part was easy. Yeah, it yeah. was a lot easier to integrate. I sp they spoke the same language as me. <laughs> Um, so the, the interns themselves was a bit different. I actually, I bonded mostly with the international interns. There were two, two French, uh, an Argentinian and a, and a Kiwi, and they were all interested in wine. But the team was so big that there was a, a, a fair amount of people just there for work. So not necessarily interested in wine. Good people, really good people, but uh, not necessarily learning from them the same way. How long were you there? I think I was there for five months. I did a, I did a pretty big stint there. Penfolds makes a lot of wine. Yeah. Um, most most of it is Shiraz, but uh, it was really cool riding my bike 20 minutes to and from work every day, uh, living with uh, someone that was basically an uncle. Do you know Daryl Groom? Oh yes. So his his brother-in-law I was living oh, with. Oh yeah. Nice. It was really beautiful spot. Uh, so now you're with the family yeah. member basically. I even I was actually living with uh, Sadie Schroeder, Mick Schroeder's oh, daughter oh, as well. Wow. So was she working there too or was she just there? She was working at Yalumba. Okay. So winery great. nearby. That exactly. Somebody grew up with, right? So yeah. Like so like I said, it was much more comfortable like there, easier to integrate, easier to like get by. Maybe that I found out a little bit later, maybe afterwards, that though that environment's nice, it doesn't necessarily push me. It doesn't challenge me in the same way that somewhere like Chile and France did where you know I'm exceeding the expectation when I'm working but in Australia well, I can relax a little bit more and you're not outside your comfort level yeah. like you are in the other exactly. areas get a not big on the complacency though like that's kind of what it started to feel like a little bit but a beautiful experience definitely look yep. when you Sorry, Susan. Oh, so, like, five months is a is a is a pretty long stint. So, like, what what at what time are you like arriving, and what time are you leaving, right? Because that sort of covers yeah, that was a big one. Harvest and fermentation. I mean, like, so when are you getting there, and when are you leaving for like in terms of what production was? Yeah, for this one, I got there. I I, th I started working like January. They oh, okay. they called me up early, and and Sadie Sadie, who I was living with, uh, we spoke a little bit about it. We're like, all right, let's go, let's go a little bit early anyway. So we actually flew into to Cairns to go diving at the Great Barrier Reef before we <laughs> skipped uh, over to the Barossa awesome. Valley. <laughs> that is awesome. But uh, ended up there, I want to say like the 21st, before the 30th I was working and I, I ended up working all the way until May. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that is five months into yeah. May, first couple weeks. It was a bit definitely slow in the beginning. And I find this with some, some winery work when you show up it's a lot more comfortable if you can get there before the grapes do. Yeah. And you can find out, you know, where the bathroom is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ease into it. Things yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> learn learn uh, the other employees, meet them and, and such, instead of just showing up in the heat of it. Yeah. So uh, in Australia, I did show up a little bit a couple weeks early, maybe three weeks before we had grapes or so. So got to like work. The facility's big, so got to learn a little bit about like their mechanics and stuff before, before the, uh, the pressure was there. Wow. Well, I think that we will move on to this beautiful yeah. red wine. It's getting How a little chilly Luke's out like, here. Man. He's got a pretty good a little adventure going here. It's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it has been, it's been a quick, uh, quick three years, yes. three and a half years. Let's hand that to <laughs> Yeah. And we can transition. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing and we're not even done yet. I know. <laughs> Truly. So uh, that's halfway. We have to have Luke back for the second phase of this. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I know. So this is the Forefathers Alexander Valley Cabernet. It looks like it's 2018 vintage. And so this is uh, one of my family's uh, top cabernets. Uh, they they have the a GV uh, labeled cabernet as well. But this is uh, the Forefathers series, and, and it's the one that I uh, connect with the most, I think. It's based on the f my dad's idea of getting the four wines from four New World countries that are making it in, in I guess, that kind of style. So he has a, a Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc from the Marlborough, mm -hmm. which, you know, is what it's known for, as well as... A forefather Shiraz from the McLaren Vale in South Australia, 
a Malbec from the Uco Valley in Argentina, and then this is the Cabernet from California. So it's the idea of representing the varietals in, in the place that they're, they're best known. And it's such an international brand that you know, I relate with it very well, like in that same kind of regard where I was going places to focus on, on those wines in particular. Now, this brand has been around for a while, hasn't it? Yeah, I think this might have even been his first brand, maybe. I know that there's some bottles in 91 around. Uh, we've had have a, access to them. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, here and there, you know, we have we have some flooding that happens in our house, so I'm always down there like cleaning off these these dusty bottles and <laughs> just for the next flood to come by and, and get them. But uh, definitely have some old bottles down there. Not many of them, but they still show well. I think I had a 2000 or 1998 uh, Forefathers Cab just. Uh, maybe two months ago, which is uh, my sibling's uh, birth year. So we opened one of those up just to check, just to check it was still good. <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was still it? worth it. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. Stellar, stellar to see wines like that. Um, that my dad, you know, would have made all those years ago, you know, kind of early on, earlier on in his Well, career. he's a very, very talented winemaker. Yeah. yeah. Done well. And, so, and is that, is that the origin of Forefathers? Yeah. Uh, so he's had a, a few renditions of the label come, come and go. At this point, only the Cabernet and the Sauvignon Blanc are still uh, in production. The, the Malbec and the Shiraz are a bit harder to find. Those are the ones that are hiding in the basement somewhere. But you know, if I, if I can in inherit a brand like this or something, I'd really uh, mm. like to carry something like that. I think it's really beautiful. That's nice. Have you tasted it? It's incredible. <laughs> yes, yeah, of course I'm just, I have. I'm just being quite enjoying my, <laughs> my, the, my wine over here. Wow. This so, is uh, beautiful. Some nice like dry herb, some plum and black cherry. Wow. It's, uh, this comes from northern end of Geyserville and the vineyard itself is really s small, small berries, uh, cane pruned, dry farms. And, and small berries is a thing. For those of you who don't, yeah. small berries make the wine more intense and yeah, a higher a higher ratio to sk of skin to pulp during fermentation can uh, extract a little bit more. Uh, you end up with a, a bit more of a rich, concentrated wine, and that's and that's what this is. With no irrigation, it's even more so. Yeah. So it's dry farmed. Yes. Yeah. You'll hear about like a lot of dry farm cab vineyards out there, right? I mean. Yeah. No, that's. Oh, oh, exactly. Well, here we go. So, it is in the Alexander Valley to the left of the river, like the west side of the Russian River, but mm -hmm. not into the Dry Creek Valley, south of Cloverdale. Is it hillside? It is an east-facing hillside, yeah, which is pretty unusual around, around there because most of the hillsides uh, are heavily forested or too steep to plant. Yeah. And... And, and it's a family vineyard. Correct? Yeah, this wow. one is. And obviously, quickly, people can buy this from. Yeah, I think the you website. can actually even get this one in Safeway as well, but online as well at goldschmidtvineyards.com. I could share a, a phone number at the end of this as well. <laughs> we always you want cell can. numbers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Send them to the website, Luke. That's, yeah. what, that's what mom will want. That's right. Yeah, this is thing. honestly it's like one of my favorites that my, my family makes. It's definitely. delicious. Okay, so we you, you decided that. Uh, it was time to leave Australia. Yeah. And how did your next internship transpire? I originally thought I might stop after Australia. And was, it, was it Spain? Yeah, next? I went to Spain next. I decided I was having too much learning and entertainment at the same time to, to stop and didn't necessarily need to come back yet. And uh, ended up getting a job in uh, La Rioja in Spain uh, with Campo Viejo, which is. Okay, this I love this photo. Is that that's a, a tank? That's a tank. How many gallons is that? Five hundred liter, fifty liter? Wow. I can't even remember. That it was is, tiny. That is so small. So I'm I'm actually aerating it it's by it's like little micro getting whoops. it in that bucket and tipping it back over the top. But this was a I mean Campo Viejo is a huge facility, but I ended up working in the experimental section with nothing but small batches. We got to make some orange wine. Is this breakfast? I had to throw that in there, honestly. <laughs> I probably ate like, I don't know, a hundred of those champignones, uh, which are delicious. They're mushroom fried with a secret sauce of garlic and butter <laughs> and shrimp on the top. And they just like melt into the bread. 
I, I mean, pinchos are, are what they have in Logroño, uh, which is the city I was living in, in La Rioja. And I mean, I, I honestly probably had a hundred of those easily. Wow, so <laughs> that looks delicious. So good. So the food was outstanding. The, the food was course. outstanding. This Logroño uh, has a street um, that is nothing but tasting rooms and, and tapas. Nice. And it tasting rooms and tapas. Yeah. It's Spent like, a lot of, lot of nights that. on that no. street. <laughs> so you got to work in like the, like the experimental division, uh, yeah. basically? That must have been... So after doing what you were doing, that must have been like yeah. really coveted and a very cool little gig. Yeah, I d something that really struck me there, we got to make some orange wine, which I hadn't done before, leaving, uh, making a white wine and leaving the skins on for, for, I mean, I think we crushed it maybe the first week I was there and it was still in tank when I left. Well, that's very trendy right now. Yeah, it is. Did you like it? I, I actually did like it. <laughs> I did. And I think the other one that I found there was a, a macabeo, a white grape that is grown extensively in the area. And it's somewhat like Chardonnay in the way that it's really malleable. You can, you can stainless steel ferment it, you can put it in oak, you can uh, give it oxygen and, and such. It was a, a really interesting varietal to work with that I had not in the past yeah. and huge there. So were you um, administering the experiments they were interested in and then so the other interns, which were sp Spanish people, uh, they were they actually had projects in the winery. So I was I was assisting them in, in taking their analysis and to like the and research assistant. Yeah, very cool. really so they cool. ran the projects and, and together we uh, facilitated the fermentations. It was really cool. Were there um, outcomes that you didn't anticipate from some of these lots? Um, we did find some some interesting differences just in and how reductive you can make a wine or how, how oxidative you can make a wine just based on some of, the, some of the yeast that was used or not used, like just having a natural fermentation versus uh, certain strains of yeast that were used. It was, it was a bit more applied research and I. Kind of like working like in a, like almost like a lab setting, right? Where there yeah, were it was pretty rigid trials that you, were, that you guys were running. Exactly, so like to really see those differences. I mean, we had, as well as like ferments in stainless versus ferments in, in barrel. Uh, definitely uh, learned a lot in, in, yeah. in those subtle differences that they had. You know, it's like, I always say like, like a lot of times in the, the kind of the general mindset of a consumer sometimes is, uh, you know, the big winery, you know, little wineries are good and big winery is not so good. And we, you know, they're more of like a, uh, a production facility, but the reality is like a lot of the real innovation occurs at the larger facilities because they have the resources to be able to do that's a really good something point. like that that's right and point. then it trickles down it does to, I agree. you know the the medium and smaller producers and i think a lot of people don't realize that and you got to work in that situation yeah i, I felt i definitely felt that in spain you know i mean it was a huge facility i mean after australia which is also penfolds like massive facility Right. Uh, in the end, and but also getting to see those those minor nuances that they are that they are playing with and that they are interested in, and and making making wines in a way that that they can use them. It was really cool. Yeah, and then and then and then scale it to the larger exactly lots, yeah. right? And and they definitely take care on on the large lots as well. You know, it's not like it's not like it's not like they're ignoring the large lots yeah. and focusing on the little lots. Put a lot of put a lot of work in in everything really. And, yeah. and you, did you, where did you live? Did, was it I, a winery situation I showed again? Up in, I showed up in Spain without a, without anywhere to live this time. So <laughs> I, I Mom and dad probably love that. Yeah, yeah. I lived, <laughs> I lived in a hostel on the El Camino uh, for a week. Oh, no. And there were just hikers coming in and out, waking me up every single day. So you just carried everything that you had, that you backpack. owned with you at all times. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I got a big backpack. But I eventually uh, got in touch with someone that was from, I think they were from Colombia, and they had moved to Spain, got in contact with them, and ended up living in a family's basement for oh a few gosh. months. I had like a, a large space, enough space to cook, enough space to have a have a bathroom, my own my own space. It was really nice, and it was actually kind of nice to jump back and live in a family house yeah. where I could hear like kids upstairs and stuff. It was kind of uh, a comfortable, refreshing thing. 
that I hadn't had. After the hostel for a week, I'm yeah. sure you're oh. like, oh my God. Oh, after the hostel. Was Basement's great. great. Yeah, Anything it's cool. Great. Yeah, no <laughs> running water, no problem. Are you calling <laughs> home and letting them know you're in a hostel, but looking yeah. for other places? Yeah. And oh, yeah, even the people at the hostels after a week are like, so you find anywhere to live? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's time for you to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, this isn't, a, it's like the, this isn't an appropriate residence, Luke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it was, all, it was not <laughs> ideal. But the living situation after that was, was excellent. And do you like Spain? You enjoyed I, the country? I loved Spain. It was so was it? Good. good food like France, yeah. but I mean, I can speak in Spain, can't speak in France. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, and I hadn't spent so much time in that country in the past and was really looking forward to it. That was uh, one that really, uh, I think, a country that I could connect with in Europe very oh, much. Yeah. Well, they're friendly and the food is outstanding. Yeah. And the cultures, it's, a, it's just lively. a- Lively. Yeah, it's lively yeah. and- People, people are up late, people are like. <laughs> Having a good time. Yeah, but you know, a lot of the places that the wine, wines grow and, and that I've visited, you know, aren't totally dissimilar to, to here, you know. Right. We like to get together, have a barbecue and share wine and, and, and value a lot of the same things that you do that comes along with wine, you know. Your farm, your, your food, your, your friends. And, and this translates in, in every place that I've been to. And that's been like, extremely beneficial to, to see and experience and learn. Well, they're really discussing the uh, essence of the industry. It is uh, some of the reasons I'm here, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And in Spain, were you also doing viticultural work or in that internship, were you in the winery as well? I was actually only in the winery in, in Spain, unfortunately. I got cut a little short on, on the harvest. It ended a little bit sooner than I had anticipated because of what, like? Just weather and, weather and, and yeah. uh, work availability. Uh, I ended up, I think I only worked two and a half months there, no, three months there. Okay. So pretty much just the harvest and then was out. Uh, but I was in Spain and wasn't prepared to leave. On, on this stint, I actually did not come back to the California in between. Most of the time I would stop in California, even if it's for two weeks right. to kind of repack my bag and, and leave again. But this time I actually, didn't come back. I went directly to Argentina afterwards. Wow. And again, was that through your network of interns you were starting to meet? Yeah. Um, st definitely still building building that network and uh, met a few other winemakers my age from adjacent countries, Italy and Italy and Greece. I mean, places. I mean, I've been to Italy, but never even been to Greece, and and to meet someone that has a family winery there that was also doing the same sort of thing as me. I mean, definitely looking forward to, to meeting up with them again in the future. I think one of the things that's so impressive about you to me is, um, you know, every six months or you're, you're like restarting new, you know, new language, new country, new culture, new uh, co-workers, no yeah. friends, right? That's I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Um, that's, that's got to be really hard. It had to be hard. Yeah, that's a huge thing to recognize because I do think that that is the toughest part. Um, ex you said it exactly. To show up somewhere, I don't know anyone. I don't know the language. I have to start a new job, and everyone knows what the first day is. You got to prove job yourself, feels like. right? Yeah, I'm trying to learn the whole time. I'm trying to like stay like mentally focused and and motivated. It is. It was a learning process. I definitely got better at it. Yeah. By the time I was arriving in Argentina, I did not have a problem. You're like but, a pro. But every, you know, all those other vintages before, it definitely took a f usually two, three weeks of, of like really getting used to it. Yeah. But, uh, well, but yeah, I mean, start. It does become very exhausting. Yeah, trying to make new friends every time, trying to like uh, learn a new area. Always interesting, but definitely energy consuming. <laughs> well, it's going to translate well for the rest of your life. I'm very grateful that I'm doing it or have had done it uh, at the time that I did. Kind of had, have had an opportunity um, and never really, never really doubted it. Even, even when I thought about stopping in between Australia and Spain, I kind of had a, had a long think about, you know, if I were to stop, how am I supposed to go backwards? and jump into these international harvests again. Because it is very difficult for those reasons. Yeah. You really have to like dedicate a lot of that, your, your time and your life. You know, I've on, I only spent maybe four months in the US in three years. It was not a lot of time that I got to, to relax. And then your, your final internship, 
Argentina. Was Argentina. Yeah. And so, and di were you in Argentina when COVID? Yeah. Hit? I actually got there. So this is Catena Zapata, where where I worked. All of these all these wineries are very architecturally uh, yeah. satisfying. They call this the Pyramid Winery. And, and so I was wow. also in the experimental section. So we had 200 ferments in this small area between oh. bins. There's some concrete eggs in there. There's some spheres. A, lo a lot of those puncheons are full of wine. Uh, it was, it was full-on work, and it was uh, a really cool place to be. Again, like, cool team, very Opus-esque here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those, those architectural nuances that uh, you know, pass from place to place. There aren't very many people who can say opus esque with opus -esque. authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, so I arrived in Argentina in February, and I think two weeks after I got there, the the region of Mendoza locked down. So if you were outside the province, you couldn't enter without quarantining. And I think maybe in it must have been late March, some of the other interns had shown up. And some of them had to leave very quickly because in, in March, all the governments are like, all right, yeah. you either come home or, or you make that decision to stay indefinitely. So I did lose a little bit of the team that was there. So it was just me and the Argentinians at that point. But uh, I opted to stay. I had no obligation to come back to California. I had no other work. I, I, I mean, I had dedicated myself to, to be in Argentina. Right. And like I said, I was comfortable this time. I can speak. Actually, Argentinian Spanish like came easiest <laughs> compared to Chile or Spain. At Argentina, I, I speak very much like that, so it was easier to get along there. Had a good housemate. Uh, so you stayed through the harvest? Yeah, I stayed all the way until uh, May. I came back, so another uh, four month stint. It, and, and it did get cut a little bit short because of COVID. Uh, the work started to run out just at the end. And getting a flight out was very difficult. I mean, I couldn't, usually I would stay and I would travel in the area that I'm working, but that wasn't really an option at the time. No, no free movement. I did have a few weekends before lockdown to like, to go to the mountains, but once it did lock down, it was just in between work and home. And they had police on the freeways, stopping every car, yeah. checking all your, your ability to be uh, mobile and passing. Through the different regions, right? So yeah. Well, it was even in just the cities. It was just like any part of the any part of the freeway. Sometimes I would be walking home. I would get a a carpool that would drop me off about a thirty minute walk to my house. So I, during that walk, on two occasions, there was a police line on the street that oh, would wow. check my papers, be very curious about foreigners being uh, around just because of what, what was going on. Right. So just be a little bit intimidating, like talking, talking, <laughs> explaining why I'm here, what I'm doing, how long I've been here. Yeah. But even getting home was an adventure for you. Yeah, right? it was. It was something else. I, I definitely look back on it fondly. But there were some times where uh, it was so unique. I mean, you would not see here in the U.S., you know, military out there with large guns like making sure that everyone is inside their house it was almost like martial law yeah. where here you know everyone would be all upset and up in arms and whatnot but in argentina it was uh pretty strict and pretty immediate it happened over like like a weekend it went from zero to a hundred to lock down those those yeah. cases and they did a good job at the time and then was it easy for you to find a flight back no i after that the come home or don't come home passed the Mendoza airport shut down, and there was no flights between Argentina and the U.S. for four weeks, just zero. There was a couple that would, I think, would bounce in Panama, but I didn't want to risk getting stuck somewhere right. without a direct flight. So I just didn't bother. And then I think maybe a month down the line, uh, my boss, and, and I, I could tell that work is slowing down a little bit at this point, and, and there was just a chartered flight, one chartered flight that got that got put together and, uh, just for U.S. citizens or people that were able to go to the U.S. And I ended up booking that. I was like, if it's not now, <laughs> I'm going to be stuck here for a very long time. Yeah. And uh, ended up getting on a bus with a bunch of other U.S. citizens that were still down there. And I, I thought it was very curious to get into a bus. With, like, what are you guys still doing here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> but wow. 
Took a nice 13 hour bus ride to the airport. And all, just, I mean, Buenos Aires Airport is huge. And there's no one there, just yeah, zero true. people. Three, three flights out the whole day. Amazing. So now you're back in California. Yeah. It's like full circle. I, and I'm happy to be back. It's been, it's been seven years since I've lived here in Healdsburg. And, and this is the longest period of time I've been here since. Uh, I feel like I've got, there's things for me to learn again here. You know, when I first left, I felt like I kind of knew the ins and outs of, of some of the vineyards and some of the wines that my family makes and stuff, that my, my increase in knowledge would be kind of plateaued a little bit. But now, after experiencing a lot of these other places, I kind of have a, uh, a, new, a different perception on, on what can be done here. So I'm excited to be back and, and to learn a little bit more. That is so fabulous. Yeah. And the adventures will just keep continuing. I know. They don't necessarily have to end. I mess around with the thought of doing other <laughs> international harvests, but probably not, you know, seven in a row, seven harvests in a row like that. That was a bit yeah. excessive. <laughs> You're like a uh, swashbuckler out there, <laughs> a winery swashbuckler. I, I just think it's so cool. I, I wish I was as brave as you when I was, you know, when I was your just age going brave. through that. I, I just think it's incredibly impressive. And, you know, the, the, the learnings aside, you know, the things that you've lied, you'd learned that you will apply in your own career as that, as that unfolds, uh, that aside, it's like just the cool cultural adventures you've had and the people you've met and the things that you've seen. Um, yeah. You know, that's it's incredible, you. man. Yeah, that's super awesome. impressive. Good for you. Yeah. It is. It has, been, it has been something else. Definitely walked away with a lot of stories, a lot of funny stories, a lot of tough days. Definitely a lot of tough days, but yeah. definitely good friends, definitely good food, definitely like... Yeah. A lot of fun, I'm sure. A lot of laughs. A lot right? of laughs, I mean, yeah. And a lot of funny instances. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have any short-term plans, or are you playing it by ear? I'm kind of playing it by ear right now. Um, I'm, I'm back here. I don't necessarily have to leave. It's kind of hard to leave right now, but yeah. New Zealand's always an option for me just because I, I am able to go into the country. Um, but I think that there's so much opportunity here in California. I would really like to, to stay and, and wait it out a little bit more see what I can see who's around to learn from still. We'll see how it goes in the off season. I'm not really sure sure what is in Well you haven't really had an off season. I know. <laughs> so I don't I haven't seen a spring for a long time. Spring <laughs> is gonna be unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking about like just getting like a job job like not yeah, a Yeah, so know. I would I would like something a little hoping to find something a little bit more permanent. If I can find somewhere uh, well I mean aperture in particular I, I went there because they had so much, there's so much opportunity there. There's, you know, uh, a team that wasn't entirely filled. I wanted to see if I can go somewhere that I can, I can benefit them. And hopefully I can stay there. And I, I understand if, if I, something else arises and, and maybe that's the opportunity. I'm kind of, I am kind of playing it by ear, but. Well, Luke, I assure you, any place you go, you will benefit them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Do you, no is that your, do you aspire to like be like, you know, have at some point, you, you're the winemaker for your own brand or for somebody else? Is that that's sort of the progression, yeah, right? Yeah, I would love to make my own brand at some point. Yeah. Uh, I did make a little bit of wine on the side this year. Uh, it's been a couple years since I've made wine. Since since university, really, I used to make it in the used to make it in the bathroom with yeah, my yeah. with my housemates, <laughs> <laughs> but. But this year I made a little bit of wine with my brother, just a Zinfandel off of one of our properties, just because I was in, I'm here and I see that there's, there's no way it won't benefit me to, to you know, experiment wow. a little bit and, and give something a try. I've also never fermented Zin, so it well, was You put a boy's name on learning. it, right? Just to prove dad wrong. That's what I'm thinking. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going against gonna all the philosophies. philosophies. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah he'll, yeah, he'll be turning his grave one day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see what I do. <laughs> Well, this has been such yeah. a pleasure, yeah. and it's going to be so much fun to watch what you do next. Yeah, thank and you. How you progress. We will keep an eye out, possibly for a label. Hopefully, yeah. Give it, a, give it. It takes two two years to get it out. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Do but. you have any parting comments you'd like to say about this harvest and how things are going and being in beautiful Healdsburg? I'm just really grateful to be back. I'm around good friends, around good people. It feels uh, very familiar and after being for years in places that were not necessarily familiar, you know. Now I, you know, recognize people's accent. I know the type of music that people like, <laughs> yeah. you know, things like that. So it, 
the familiar familiarity is is kind of new again, and, I, and it's been very exciting. I've been really excited to come come here as well. Today wow. felt like a Friday. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm exactly. Just gonna, yeah, it is for every day. It's always Friday. Friday. Yeah. Yeah, it's always Friday in the courtyard. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again, and um, here's to the intern coming home. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, Luke. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and fan club. <laughs> well, here's to you. Good job. Um, we will see you next week in the courtyard, and in the meantime, enjoy wine, enjoy life. It was awesome. Thank you. Good. <laughs> I know.